Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar series, Cultivating Critical Language Awareness in TESOL, hosted by the BMAS Bilingual Multilingual Education Interest Section at TESOL International Association. My name is Zhong Feng Tian, currently uh, the chair of the BMAS. I'm really excited to host today's webinar. Our chair-elect Nashia from the University of Auckland is also here with us today. If this is your first time joining us to give you a bit more information about our interest section, we aim to support and promote all multilingual learners' linguistic repertoires and multiliteracy skills uh, as fundamental to the acquisition of a second or additional language. We believe that additive and dynamic approaches must be endorsed and implemented in educational institutions in the interests of students from diverse backgrounds. We support the opportunity and right of all individuals to develop, construct, and maintain a diverse range of cultural, linguistic, and literate repertoires of practice. And we work to foster collaborative relations of power and address inequitable power issues uh, relations in society and empower minority students to use their own repertoires of practice. So why cultivating critical language awareness in TESOL? First, the landscape and profession of TESOL has been constantly evolving. And increasing attention has been paid to recognizing the linguistic diversity of world Englishes, moving away from the so-called native versus non-native dichotomy, and questioning structuralist ideologies of language standardization. In TESOL teaching and learning, we see the need for more humanizing practices that value multilingual learners' local realities and funds of knowledge, and bring in voices and representation of racially, culturally, and linguistically diverse communities. Coupled with the evolving TESOL landscape is a rapidly changing world, further complicating the backdrop of English teaching and learning with a series of social and political events, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, racial justice movements, and global migration and refugee crisis. Faced with the evolving TESOL landscape situated in today's changing world, we believe that it is more important than ever to cultivate space for criticality and critical perspectives in TESOL as a means to fight for racial, social, and linguistic justice. So therefore, we organized this webinar series, uh, Cultivating Critical Language Awareness in TESOL, which features three emerging and early career scholars work with one webinar per month from January to March. Each webinar will be recorded and will last 60 minutes. Please keep your mic muted during the presentation and turn off web cameras. If you have a question or a comment, we invite you to enter it in the chat during the presentation and the presenter will address your question at the end. All participants in today's event will have access to the recorded version, which will be available within one week after the live event. So now, without further ado, let me introduce the speaker of today, Dr. Paul Megan Chiplow. Dr. Paul Megan Chiplow is a Scottish Gael and multilingual critical social linguist from Glasgow, Scotland. He is a PhD graduate in educational studies at McGill University, Canada. His research focuses on decolonial education, indigenous language revitalization, and language policy. Paul's work has been published in Alternative, TESOL Journal, ELT Journal, Diaspora, Indigenous and Minority Education Journal, International Journal of Quality, Qualitative Methods, and Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development. The title of his talk today is Addressing Colonial Lingualism in TESOL, Raising Critical Language Awareness Through Trans-Epistemic Education. Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Zhang Feng, and thank you um, for inviting me and for having me today to be speaking with you all. It's lovely to be here, and thank you to everyone at the special interest section for putting this fantastic series um, of, of the webinar and the speakers together. It's really fantastic and a fantastic initiative that I'd love to see more of going into the future. So I'm very grateful to be speaking with you all today, and I'll now share my screen. 
I'm, sh I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay, seeing as there's no, no problems or no indication otherwise. Okay, and can you all see that okay? Can someone indicate if you can see that okay? Yes, yes. Perfect, thank you, Shankar. Okay, so um, as introduced before, I, I'm going to be talking about the title of the talk today is Addressing Colonial Lingualism in TESOL, Raising Critical Language Awareness Through Trans-Epistemic Education. Um, an overview of today and the talk. I'll first position myself. So the who am I, the where am I, um, and what has brought me to this work? I'll then talk a little bit about critical language awareness. Why does it matter? Before discussing colonial lingualism, what is it? I'll then move forward on to how can we address colonial lingualism and raise critical language awareness at the same time? I'll discuss trans epistemic education and heritage language pedagogy as an example of trans epistemic education as praxis. And here at the example of heritage language pedagogy in action with the world viewer multimodal blog. I'll then finish off with some concluding remarks and share some resources with you all that may be of interest to those who would like to explore these avenues of research further. So, co Misha, is Misha Paul Miachin Shiblo, Shigail Ahanum, Luga Agus Hokemion and Glasuhu Alapa, Shana used to Jesus Aham Hyolach, Agus Hai and Udango, Avi Abreen Rive. So, I introduce myself in my language, which is Gaelic or Scottish Gaelic. My name is Paul Megan Shiblo. I am a Scottish Gael. I was born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland. My Gaelic family and community is from the Isle of South Uist, and it's an honour and a privilege to be talking with you all today. So some motivations for my research. My what, what has brought me here to this point? My research is motivated by the harms of colonisation and imperialism on Indigenous languages and speaker communities worldwide. Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, is an endangered Indigenous language in Scotland with approximately 57,000 speakers um, remaining. And here you can see in the upper left, sorry, yes, in the upper left, the declining numbers of Scottish Gaelic speakers from 1891 to 2001. Scottish Gaelic was not available to me in the educational system in, in Glasgow growing up as a child. And Gaelic and Gaelic culture were almost eradicated due to many factors, such as the forced eviction of Scottish Gaels from their lands and territories during the Highland Clearances and the near destruction of Gaelic clan based society at the Battle of Culloden in 1746 by British imperialist and government forces. Here in the right, you can see one of the first uses, uses of the word colonization was to refer to the Scottish Gaels, also known as Highlanders. And up here in the, the left here, it's written by Samuel, sorry, the right, Samuel Boise in 1747. And it says that this was after the Battle of Culloden I just mentioned. And the purpose of this was to colonize the newly depopulated parts of the Highlands by an industrious set of people who, by intermixing with the natives, in other words, the Highlanders, may teach them the inestimable advantages arising from diligence and commerce once their eyes have been opened to official happiness. And this care was entrusted to the Society for Propagating Christian Knowledge in the Highlands, which, quoting Samuel Boyce's words here, may in time greatly contribute to the desirable end of reforming and improving the Highlands by erecting schools for introducing the use of the English language and diffusing the true knowledge of the gospel through those regions for long benighted by ignorance and superstition. So you can see here the role of English and education in oppressing and subjugating Gaelic language and Gaelic culture. And to this day, the multi-generational and psychological impacts of the oppression of the Gaelic language and culture has resulted in the near destruction of family and community language transmission, evidenced here by the declining numbers of Scottish Gaelic speakers. 
Since meeting and marrying my Anishinaabe Ojibwe husband in Glasgow in 2016, I've also learned more from my Anishinaabe family about the devastating and ongoing harms of colonization on the indigenous peoples and languages of Turtle Island, or what is now known as North and Central America. All of these experiences um, have driven me to think of ways in which we can enact more equitable education and more equitable language policy. I'd also take, like to acknowledge where I am speaking to you from today. Vancouver is located on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and the Sailtooth nations and has been stewarded by them since time immemorial. This territory was never ceded nor was it given up to the Crown by the Musqueam, Squamish or Swilwalative peoples. And this term acknowledges the dispossession of the lands and the inherent rights that the Musqueam, Squamish and Sailtooth hold to these lands and territories. I'd just like to say miigwech, tapaleif, Thank you to the lands, waters, animals, plants and spirits of Turtle Island for sustaining me. And I'm very grateful to be speaking with you all today. And I would encourage you all to think about the lands that you're on at the current moment and the indigenous lands and the indigenous languages of the lands in which you are located and by which you are all sustained. So critical language awareness, why does all of this matter? So now that I've introduced what's kind of brought me to this avenue or juncture of my work, um, critical language awareness highlights how languages are affected by power relations and ideologies we are often unaware of. Critical language awareness can help draw attention to the causes of ongoing social linguistic, social political and educational inequities. Education, in particular language education, has been and continues to be weaponized as a colonizing tool. Multilingualism was common across the globe before colonial and imperial expansion, the one nation, one language community associated with the Western nation state system, and quote, ideologies of contempt towards indigenous languages and their speakers. Indigenous and minoritized languages and communities worldwide have been subjected to genocide, destructive and discriminatory government policies and legislation, and ongoing practices of linguicide and historicide. Indigenous and minority languages and communities continue to be threatened by the advance of dominant colonial languages, such as English, and ethnocentric nation state monocultures. Studies estimate one language is quote unquote lost every one to three months. However, language loss is not natural, nor is it unavoidable. May underscores here that language loss is not only not even primarily a linguistic issue, it has much more to do with power, prejudice, unequal competition, and in many cases, overt discrimination and subordination. This information is not new. However, there is a continued lack of historical balance and consideration of local so social cultural and social political contact contexts, such as the ongoing impacts of colonization on indigenous and minoritized communities and languages in TESOL and education more broadly. Colonial lingualism, what is it? Colonial lingualism is the privileging, the ongoing privileging of dominant colonial languages, knowledges, and neoliberal valorizations of diversity in education and policy. Systemic, structural, and institutional change is urgently needed to address ongoing tools of colonization, such as colonial lingualism. Examples include My screen just went a little bit dark there. Monolingual and monocultural learning environments such as English-only classrooms with ethnocentric white, quote, native speaker materials that exclude the peoples and knowledges of the local speaker communities and their lands. Decontextualized disembodied languages, resource languages, code tasks such as a cultural, a historical comprehension activities. Privileging the Western print canon and standard forms of language, quote unquote standard, such as an idealized upper middle class homogenous language. Deprivileging land based or place based education, community language definitions, and visual oral semiotic literacies and repertoires, such as pictographs, body art, standing stones, and dreams as interpretation or acquisition of knowledge. 
And here, finally, another example is physical, mental punishment and violence for speaking a heritage, minoritized or indigenous languages and indigenous language. And these are just some examples. They're non-exhaustive non and there are more. Colonial linguism transmits colonial and imperial thinking, reasoning, mindsets, and worldviews through language and languaging. And going back to critical language awareness at the, the, the point I made at the beginning, these processes we may not even be aware of, but they are ongoing in education and in our classrooms. Colonial lingual injustices are harmful to multilingual, multicultural learner identities and heritages, endangered indigenous languages and knowledges, and minoritized communities. Subjective present-day English-only monolingual and monocultural TESOL classrooms perpetuate detrimental narratives and actions of epistemic and linguistic superiority, racisms, cultural assimilation, and further mar marginalized indigenous heritage and minoritized language speakers. I'll now move on to trans-epistemic education and heritage language pedagogy. Now I've given a little bit of background to colonial lingualism, ongoing tools of colonization. What can we do about this? How can we address this in our classroom or in education more broadly? So locating and critically reflecting on our worldview, the knowledge and belief system through which we operate is fundamental. Epistemology or a way of knowing relates to knowledge, knowledge systems, and how we come to know things. English carries a colonial, assimilative legacy and a human centered worldview char characterized by linguistic imperialism and cognitive imperialism, human exceptionalism or the view that humans are superior to nature, and white epistemological supremacy. Human exceptionalism here quoting Plumwood, is the idea that humankind is radically different and apart from the rest of nature and other animals, which has allowed us to exploit nature and people more ruthlessly. And Bateson, back in 1972, notes, we are most of us governed by epistemologies that we know to be wrong, and the creature that wins against its environment destroys itself. Dominant languages such as English, however, don't exist in vacuums, and do not cause harm in and of themselves. And Bell Hooks states that it is not the English language that hurts me, but what the oppressors do with it, how they shape it to become a territory that limits and defines, how they make it a weapon that can shame, humiliate, and colonize. With ongoing colonial lingual epistemic injustices and inequitable practices, there is a need to unlearn cognitive and linguistic imperialism, human exceptionalism, white epistemological supremacy, in other words, an epistemic unlearning, so that all multilingual and multicultural learners are respected and validated in TESOL classrooms. I propose a heritage language pedagogy as part of trans-epistemic language education to action this unlearning. Trans-epistemic education is the act of learning from multiple knowledges and life ways to equip educators, learners, and humanity more broadly with more conceptual tools for sustainable and relational futures. Trans-epistemic language education, more specifically, is a way of learning, teaching, knowing, and being, which enables respectful and non-hierarchical knowledge co-creation while we engage with languages, peoples, cultures, and lands. And heritage language pedagogy exemplifies how this can be done. And I'll be sharing this all with you now. Heritage language education is, of course, not new to mainstream applied linguistics, TESOL, and English language teaching. However, my conceptualization of heritage language pedagogy emphasizes earth centered learning processes to delink and move beyond from human exceptionalism and individualism, center and relink the relational connection between language and place, which is, quote, uh, quoting Engman and Hermes here, not a primary language objective in many English and world language classrooms, and engage diverse ecocentric and kin-centric knowledge systems, such as those indigenous and minoritized. For example, the learning of indigenous place names to highlight multilingualism and multiculturalism that predates European contact in North America. 
I don't define heritage as something of the past, but rather as something in flux, something that is intrinsic to all multidimensional, multicultural, multilingual learners and educators based on our own lived experiences and our own intersectionality. My conceptualization of heritage language pedagogy, therefore, seeks to include all the languages, cultures and knowledges that inhabit a specific land, place and community. So this applies to everyone here listening today. Heritage language pedagogy problem problematizes the uncritical use of dominant nation state colonial languages, universalizing or essentializing knowledge systems and colonial lingual ideologies in TESOL, including popular global north translanguaging and plurilingual contexts. For example, translanguaging, particularly when conceptualized from the global north, and this is exemplified in an article by Kanagaraja written last year, could result in language loss and further threaten endangered indigenous languages. Deconstructivist translanguaging, that is the contention that languages do not exist, has dangerous implications for indigenous and minoritized languages and peoples already subjected to colonial erasure and genocide. Structural inequalities can be disregarded and only dominant nation state languages and knowledge systems such as English and Eurocentrism are quote unquote valued for assumed linguistic, economic or cultural capital. And I give the examples of English here, but this applies to any language with a colonial or imperial, imperial legacy worldwide. Heritage language pedagogy as part of trans epistemic education centers our learners diverse worldviews and knowledge systems in increasingly fluid multicultural multilingual and transnational global contexts. Heritage language pedagogy enables learners and educators to engage in a decolonial exchange of knowledges alongside language learning, which emphasizes a dynamic plurality of knowledges, not just one dominant universalizing and privileged system, such as Eurocentrism. A culturally vitalizing and respectful non-hierarchical knowledge co-creation process, which includes our learners' worldviews, and knowledge systems is therefore encouraged by educators and fostered by trans systemic knowledge exchanges. Trans epistemic education also raises critical language awareness by drawing further attention to existing power imbalances, injustices, and inequities, and enables a greater exchange of worldviews and knowledges for a trans epistemic dialogue on present and future sustainability issues, such as the climate and humanitarian crises, based on existing learner knowledges about their own lands, their own communities, their own contexts, and their own lived experiences that may have been overlooked, diminished, or excluded in mainstream TESOL contexts. So putting all of this into practice, the world viewer is an example here. I have action trans epistemic education and heritage language pedagogy in my classrooms by including texts that were created by authors with non dominant ecocentric worldviews, such as indigenous authors and creators, alongside those already included in existing curricula. The example here is a post secondary college English for academic purposes, up quote unquote, upper intermediate class for international and immigrant students in Toronto. Toronto and what is now known as Canada. I created a five lesson mini unit where we explored the rhetorical, grammatical, lexical and cultural aspects of a text and produced an interactive blog which charted our English language learning and knowledge co-creation journey. I named this multimodal online blog in exchange of worldviews a worldviewer. And the mini unit I designed formed part of the wider EAP curriculum to meet existing college course requirements, such as quote unquote academic writing assessments. So I understand that this is common in TESO context, ELT context, where we are ten many educators tend to be given a curriculum and expect to just teach it. And the same happened to me, where I was giving materials where TED Talks, um, articles, but most of them were written from a white perspective, white, quote unquote, native speakers from either North American context or global North context. So what I did was I substituted those for texts written by indigenous authors or offers from minor marginalized communities. Um, 
so that the learners could interact with those knowledge systems instead of just the one Eurocentric privileged lens. So our world of Europe is an online multimodal and multilingual trans epistemic language education environment where learners and educators, so it's not just learners that are unlearning, it's us too, the educators, the, the so-called teachers, can share insights from their own worldviews, heritages, and co-create knowledge in a respectful and non-hierarchical manner. So going back to what I said before, I chose this text as part of the mini unit, which we were focusing on the environment. So I chose this text, uh, extinction of indigenous languages lead to exclusive knowledge of medicinal plants. This was written by Monga Bay, it was accessible online, but it also had a link to an academic article. So it also fulfilled the quote unquote academic writing requirements um, that I was speaking about before. And here is the, the mini unit. Um, and I've written about this in a, a book chapter as well. I'd be happy to share the resource for those who would like to look at it in more depth. But here you can see the lessons broken down um, over five text focus, rhetorical, visual, grammatical, cultural. So rhetorical, for example, the task was to research the author, the publisher. What, and to identify bias, reason why text was written. Then we looked at the visuals because visuals also have an impact on knowledge um, and how we acquire knowledge or what knowledges or, or worldviews are silenced. So again, investigating bias, the impact of visual rhetoric and nonverbal communication. And I, I won't go through everyone, but you can see here each lesson had a specific focus uh, grammatical, lexical, and cultural here to look at culturally specific tools, conceptual tools, for example, here in lesson five, um, to explore an exchange of worldviews, experiences, the impact of worldviews on the planet, cultural and linguistic diversity, for example, colonization, the climate crisis, and indigenous language endangerment. And you can see here, the students had a group activity where they could co-create um, and use video, so YouTube videos, and they could upload them to the, the platform that we had, our online blog. There was discussion forums on the learning management system, the Moodle, um, and also they have a, an opportunity for an individual e-journal where they could reflect on their experiences after each lesson. And all of this was carried out um, using English. However, at the same time, we were operating at an at a, a, systemic trans epistemic level where we were engaging with knowledge systems ways of knowing um, which provided further stimulation and insights and here is an example of the video response at the end of the project um, please video record your responses if you wish you can also use visuals or images instead of words to express how you feel um, and there's some words there, what are key themes? Um, do you think cultural linguistic and uh, diversity is important? How does this article relate to your experience of language oppression, et cetera, et cetera. And then we would upload this to the class blog. And then I would ask them to interact with at least three of their classmates videos and add a comment on how their experience with the text related um, to their own. And here is an example of the self-assessment tool. Um, sorry. Um, where learners could reflect on uh, certain specific prompts um, here. Um, how did the use of images and visuals in the article impact you? What message did they convey? How do you think certain word choices contribute to the emotion of the text? Why? Um, why and how are Indigenous languages important? And so on and so forth. So as, as World of Viewers learners, uh, collaboratively reflected on prompts about the online multimodal text and linked publication, such as who wrote this article, which languages and images are you using, which worldviews are validated, privileged, or silenced. And as I mentioned before, learners tracked their progress on the self-assessment log, and they could reflect on their language learning and meaning-making journeys, and what they've learned from their multimodal and multilingual co-construction and sharing of knowledges. As world reviewers, we contrasted and compared names for plant medicines and diverse languages. These are examples of what came up in our classroom, for example. Um, and here, uh, Cameron Larry and Bascomte in a recent article found that 
actually this is an article linked to the text I was talking about before, found that in three regions worldwide with high biocultural diversity, over 75% of all 12,495 medicinal plant services are linguistically unique, known to only one indigenous language. So the loss of these languages, going back to the beginning of the talk here, one, approximately one to three, oh sorry, one language is lost every one to three months. This is what's being lost here. Um, and we also reflected on experiences and knowledges from our family's heritage languages and cultures, such as traditional and or indigenous place names and what they meant. We compared sustainable agricultural practices and heritage languages and cultures to share ecological insights about the land. We also discussed the framing of the environment and language endangerment in dominant neoliberal English discourse, such as, now this happens a lot in English, and I would, I would encourage you to look the next time you look at articles or newspapers, this happens a lot, such as the degradation of the environment, the extinction of indigenous languages, as if these things are naturally occurring, which they are not. So we evaluated the impact of the normalization of the English noun in this case. Who is degrading the environment? How do languages become quote unquote extinct? Why is the agent missing? And what effect does this have on the meaning? So once we did a little bit more critical thought here and looking into why is agent missing? Why, why can't we understand the processes in more depth? Then we really looked at a really deeper trans epistemic level here. And it ties back into the reason critical language awareness as well, the purpose of this webinar series. We also shared ways to make more earth-centered language and metaphors to talk about the environment. Now, like I said before, in going back to CLA, critical language awareness, many of these things we may not be unaware of, but if we ask ourselves, why do certain people, maybe even ourselves, call areas of land dumping grounds or some animals as vermin? How do you relate to those words? And then how do you treat this land? Do you, do you go and dump more things on this land because it's called a dumping ground? Do you treat certain animals differently because they're called vermin, for example? They're, th these can be applied across various different contexts. Um, and what would be another way of naming this land that is more respectful of all its inhabitants, including human, animal, and more than human entities? So lots of lines of exploration and investigation here. And, and as world of yours, we co-created works in English that demonstrated a thorough understanding of rhetorical, visual, grammatical, lexical, and cultural features of academic text. So one criticism sometimes that comes up with critical pedagogies, um, let's say, is that, oh, but we need to make sure they're fulfilling, quote unquote, academic writing requirements. This, th this is an example where you can still do that and also bring in that critical lens. We operated at a pluralistic trans epistemic level to expand on the benefits and limits of pedagogical trans languaging. And what I mean by this is learners shared examples of place based and culturally specific concepts in their own languages and in their own knowledge systems. They elaborated on them in English to make a deeper meaning with peers on an epistemic and linguistic level. So there was an exchange of not only language, let's say, or um, multimodal expression, but there was also an exchange of knowledge systems or epistemes. So languages were not just considered as quote unquote words. And a couple of examples from the classroom, one learner from Turkey shared they have whistled languages there, which stimulated a really exciting topic where a um, couple of the students went online, YouTubed a couple of other examples of whistled languages, checked if they have whistled languages in their own countries, for example. And another learner from Mexico shared how chocolate is the original hot chocolate drink and originated in Mayan culture. And this learner also offered to bring in some ch uh, chocolate as well, which was great, a great experience for everyone on the day. So these insights and experiences stimulated further knowledge sharing and co-creation about whistled languages across the globe, for example, and ecologically sustainable Mayan cacao cultivation. So that we're, we're not only sharing this is hot chocolate, but it's also the processes behind it and also how you can work in relation to the lands you're on and live in relation to the lands as well. So heritage language pedagogy acknowledges the existence of and accommodates insights from all languages, majority, minoritized, nonverbal, and indigenous, and their associated knowledge systems. 
And some concluding remarks here. Heritage language pedagogy as trans epistemic language education praxis, informed by all the languages, cultures, and knowledges that inhabit a specific land and community. So I say this, and I'm just to reiterate, it could be in any context. So I'm in Vancouver right now. So I would engage with the lands and cultures and contexts of these lands. And this would be culture and place based and context specific as well. So all to engage the learners, cultures in an additive way, not to subtract from existing her learner heritages, knowledges, um, and the, all of the knowledge that they already possess. So this is proposed as a way in which educators and learners can raise critical language awareness and at the same time begin addressing colonial lingualism, the dominance of colonial languages, nation state languages, non-endangered languages in the classroom and in TESOL. Trans-epistemic English language teaching via non-hierarchical knowledge co-creation activates an epistemic unlearning, so learning and also unlearning, by challenging dominant Western mental models and assumptions, global monocultures, and such as cognitive and linguistic imperialism and human exceptionalism. Again, going back to what is human exceptionalism, the belief that humans are radically different from nature so that humans can therefore exploit uh, the quote-unquote other and the environment more ruthlessly. So this also has implications for how can we address the climate crisis from within the walls of our TESOL classrooms. The world of Europe as an example of heritage language pedagogy illustrates how learners co-created knowledge through the lens of their own alternative, endangered, heritage, minoritized, or indigenous languages and their own worldviews while languaging in English. The greater exchange of worldviews and knowledges enabled greater opportunities for trans-epistemic, decolonial, and a pluriversal dialogue on present and future sustainability issues, such as the climate and humanitarian crises, based on existing knowledge, learner knowledges that may have been overlooked, diminished, or excluded in mainstream Western TESOL classrooms. And just some resources here um, to wrap up. Um, which I love. Here's an example by um, Marie Batiste, a Mi'kmaq educator. This is called Decolonizing Education, Nourishing the Learning Spirit. Um, Marie Batiste's work is fantastic. And if you're interested in what I've been talking about today, you would really enjoy exploring more of this as well um, in terms of how can we enable more trans-epistemic um, knowledge exchanges, trans-systemic knowledge exchanges in the classroom, and how can we go about unlearning those processes of cognitive and linguistic imperialism. Another um, is this book, Between Languages and Cultures, Translation and Cross-Cultural Texts, specifically the chapter written by Bell Hooks. I love Bell Hooks, and I also love this chapter. This is the oppressor's language, yet I need it to talk to you. Language is a place to struggle. I really recommend this one. And this is one the quote that I used from Bell Hooks earlier in the presentation as well. Um, this is a fantastic uh, resource. Um, I know it says translation here, but it does have implications in terms of interculturality for TESOL environments and how we can raise critical language awareness more broadly. Um, decolonizing la foreign language education, the misteaching of English and other colonial languages by Donald Donaldo. Macedo, as well as another excellent uh, resources, which interrogates current foreign language and second language education approaches that prioritize Western white thought. Um, and that's the, these are other resources where he gives exam very good examples of how you can address comprehension activities, for example, that strip any context, historical context, political context, as if language exists in a vacuum. So he gives examples of how you can incorporate more um, culturally vitalizing pedagogies and approaches in the classroom. So another fantastic resource I would recommend here. And finally, um, my article, Colonial Lingualism. If you haven't read it already, I know I've talked about it a little bit today. Um, it has been published um, last year in Diaspora, Indigenous and Minority Education Journal. It talks about most, if not all of the things that I've spoken about in the PowerPoint today. It's open access as well, um, so you, it's not behind a paywall. And it talks a little bit more in depth as well about heritage language pedagogy, how it can be um, 
incorporated um, in English language education and in TESOL. Okay, thank you everyone for listening. Um, and yes, please feel free to ask any questions. If there was anything you would like to know more, um, I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you so much for your time today and for listening. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing your uh, research and all these resources. We already have audience asking, do you mind putting those links in the chat? <laughs> and yeah, yes. For making your article open access. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those things where I just think that, you know, academia just needs to be more open access and more accessible. That was the point of doing those little um, Canva things. I'm sure many of you might have heard of Canva app, but it's just a way of trying to make some of these terms can maybe come off as a little abstract. So it's about engaging people in the conversation more. So, yeah, there's uh, open access is one of them. Um, and there's other ways to go about that. I'm sure I could learn from you um, to Chung Feng. And, and many others here, uh, ways in which we can do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so we have about like 15 uh, minutes for Q&A. So folks, feel free to put your questions or comments in the chat, or you can just use the raise hand feature and you can, I believe you can unmute yourself and you can just ask your questions. Yeah, we can make this, this more dialogic and conversational. Yeah, this part. Yeah, I think folks, oh, we, we got. Uh... Hi, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Um, first of all, Kwe uh, Paul, Kichimi Gwech for this wonderful presentation. Um, so I'm a teacher educator located in um, Ottawa, and uh, but I was trained in Europe. And over there, we talk a lot about intercultural competence. And so I've worked a little bit on thinking of critical Called intercultural competence to bring in these elements that I think you're talking about, like the awareness of power um, and hierarchies of power between different languages. So how you're going to negotiate that? Um, I just wanted to. I don't know what my question is, but have you thought about the relationship of your trans epistemic uh, education model in relation to the intercultural competence model, which is often used in education now? Have you had pushback? Have you found a way to frame it? to introduce teachers to it, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Mimi. Um, that's a good question. I think my experience of intercultural perspectives is viewing, it kind of falls into that, and I could talk about this in my colonial lingualism article as well, it kind of falls into the trap, not predominantly, this is my experience again, of seeing culture as a fossilized or monolithic thing, which is typically associated with nation states. So, for example, British culture, American culture, Canadian culture. But these things, if you strip away the surface, actually don't exist um, because there are fabrications. British culture, for example, there's so there's Celtic nations, my language, Gaelic, language, Scottish Gaelic. Um, it's very different to what British culture is. I don't even know what British culture would be. Um, and even Scotland in itself, that cover, glosses over the fact that there's Scots spoken, Gaelic spoken, English spoken. So there's a lot of multicultural, multilingual context within what's typically framed as a culture in intercultural studies or intercultural translation. So that's one thing that I I, I tend to see a lot. And again, that's part of colonial lingualism and that kind of legacy of ongoing the colon colonial mindsets where culture can be fossilized and, and viewed as some from an anthropological lens, let's say, or something that never changes, which is just not true. So that's one thing that um, I've been um, seeing um, and hearing about. Um, and I think that where trans epistemic education come in in this is in our context that I touched upon it briefly we're in increasingly fluid uh, transnational context now where we're communicating across borders flying across borders traveling across borders all the time and meeting lots of different people so it's about tapping in and engaging with those dialogues that everyone everyone here I'm pretty sure can relate to this in some way comes from 
um, let's say heritages or knowledges that may not be the the quote unquote stereotype or the mainstream presented out there. Uh, so yeah, it's about that's where I see trans epistemic education going. It's um, making space for for that existing um, heritage knowledges and backgrounds um, that have been dismissed. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to mention as well, I don't, you probably know this. I went to Nova Scotia this summer and I visited the Gaelic College of Education. There was a large community of Scottish Gaelic, Gaelish, Gaelic Scots who emigrated there and they're working on um, heritage language revitalization over there. And it was, I heard some Gaelic storytelling. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. I see we got some questions uh, in the chat. The first one is from Sonia. Just wondering how, could, how to access those reference books if we want to explore them. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think those books are open access, but I don't know if uh -huh. you like affiliated with like certain institutions, maybe you can get those resources through institutions. Yeah. And we also have a question from uh, Yue Bian. So she said, really inspiring work. Thank you for sharing, Paul. I was wondering what you see as the implications of your work on K through 12 teachers who may have to follow the curriculum of their school district and may not have a lot of capacity for modifying the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's a good question. And again, I touched upon this. I know I'm aware of the constraints that a lot of teachers may have in terms of time and planning and may be, in many cases, um, kind of like their hands are tied and what they can teach in the classroom. That's happened to me a lot. I've been teaching for a long time. And when I first started out, it was just like, you're given a book and uh, th this is the units you're teaching and go teach it. I still think you can do that. I still think you can teach that. But what's stopping anyone from saying, OK, but let's look at this article and kind of rip it apart kind of thing and kind of go, well, why is this presented this way? Do you agree with that? And encouraging the learners to get into a dialogue of saying, so why is a white person here being presented as a native speaker? Does British, going back to what I was talking about with Mimi before, does quote unquote British culture quote unquote, what does American culture even mean? We can encourage our learners to go, oh, we can actually, we can do that because what typically happens in education is going back to Paulo Freire banking model of education where students are just expected to sit in their seats and learn and not really question or ask or anything like that. So it's about raising that critical language awareness or encouraging it from a young age. And I think that can be done and the onus is on like, kind of like the educator being open to enc encouraging your students to engage in the learning or unlearning process. And it can be as easy as a couple of questions. Do you agree with that? What do you think of that? And then just making that space safer for your learners, students uh, to actually engage with the context on a context in a deeper level. And at my experience is once that door is opened, then the meaning, the learning becomes more meaningful and they don't feel that their identities have been kind of, you know, um, taken away or, you know, or that they've been excluded in the learning process. So that's a way in which I think you can do it without having to actually modify curriculum per se. You can actually disrupt the curriculum or kind of, going back to my word before, rip it apart in a way and still do the check marks. So it's about labeling it and saying, listen, this is a tool. We, we know you're here to get good grades, but let's hold on a minute and look at this text and say, what is it saying? Do you agree with that? Okay. And then uh, move on from there. So that's one way I think you could do that without looking at a, a curriculum redesign. Thank you yeah. for the question. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Paul. I think we can uh, allow one more question. I think I see a question from uh, Deb Palmer. Uh, so she's asking, I'd love to hear you elaborate a bit more on the critiques you brought, brought up of US-based translanguaging work. How do you see this work as reinforcing colonialism? How does Kanagura's idea of translingual practices differ in your view? Yeah, so if you can, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. some of your thoughts. Thank you for your question, Deborah. I think that's a really important one because I think what's happening right now, we're seeing um, translanguaging um, being very popular. We hear about it all the time. 
Um, the thing that I see as a danger, like I pointed out before, is a certain strain of translanguaging that contends that languages don't exist. I think that that's really dangerous for, uh, as I pointed out, indigenous and minoritized language communities that have already been subjected to erasure. In, in other words, if multilingual societies don't exist, neither do language rights. So there's all of that kind of like we live in a political system, which is inequitable. So um, where where we can view language as, um, yes, yeah, some could argue that it, ex it doesn't exist, but I think that that then would also say politics doesn't exist or realities don't exist or inequalities don't exist. And that's not reality. That's not true. So that's one thing that I see da a danger there. And then U.S., or, or North American or Global North translanguaging context, just going back to colonial lingualism, the majority of the languages used in those contexts are dominant nation state languages that are not endangered um, at all. So there's that too, and you'll find that the indigenous languages of the lands in which you're teaching are barely visible or represented as well. So there's that too. So Yes, we have to keep that in mind. And Kana Garaj's idea of translingual practices is looking at it from the lens of the global south, where, and also Sender Dovchin talks about this as well, where she calls it the mundanity of translanguaging. It's just something that happens on a day to day. It's not this big thing, it's just something that operates naturally to people on their day to day environments. So it's not something that's let's say, quote unquote, pushed. So there, that's how I see it differently. And, and I think that we could fall prey to um, upholding global north deconstructivist versions of translanguaging without actually realizing the dangerous implications of that for indigenous and minoritized cultures. So yes, that does reinforce colonialism and it basically copy pastes Eurocentric models and imposes them and minor further minoritizes our students. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for sharing this. Yeah, Maybe thanks. We can allow one more question <laughs> if you're open to it, Paul. So I see yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question from Tasha Austin. Uh, so I think her question is how you would position those constantly dispossessed and displaced within a place-based orientation to heritage language pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, as I put, pointed out before, is to just draw on your existing learners' knowledges and heritages and languages that already exist. Um, for example, not excluding any of the dispossessed, displaced peoples in the classroom. And I gave some examples of how you can do that, where enabling a space, and I think this start can start on day one of any course, is just share what I've turned it to do, um, looking practically at this, is be vulnerable yourself. And you'll notice going back to my presentation, I positioned myself. I told you who I am, where I am, why am I doing this? And I think if educators open themselves up and expose themselves uh, in terms of being a little bit vulnerable to your students at the beginning, then people, that your students may feel that they can trust you, that they can open up to you more, and they can feel that you're, they understand where you're coming from. So I think that's one way of placing yourself in a heritage language pedagogy in terms of, well, where am I? Um, and I said where I was in Vancouver right now, the, 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 my relationship to these lands. So these are all ways in which you can weave in um, critical language awareness, trans epistemics, heritage language pedagogy, while um, putting a focus on place as well. So it's, it's, yeah, not viewing language in a vacuum, it's viewing language as part of a broader ecosystem, part of where we are and where we live. Thank you, Paul, for offering your insights. So I think we are uh, getting close to the end of our webinar time. So before I wrap up today's webinar, I invite all of you to attend our next and last webinar in this series. So Dr. Tasha Austin from the University of Buffalo, she will talk about we've been off that mimicry, agency, and politics in critical language awareness on March 8th at noon Eastern time. So you can scan the QR code. I'm also happy to put the link in the chat later to register the webinar. 
Uh, and lastly, thank you all for being here today. If, you, if you'd like to join the BMAS team, you are welcome to email me or Nashia. We are currently looking for new members to join our leadership team. And if you'd like to stay in touch, we invite you to follow our Twitter or join our online forum. So thank you all very much. And I hope to see you all next time. Thank you.